Hi everyone, it's Chris Ng here, and I'm here to talk about RH aluminization. So this is a response to a really cool question asked by one of your colleagues. Your colleague asks, is that if we give a mother anti-D immunoglobulin for immunoprophylaxis, why don't these antibodies cross a placenta and then attack the newborn's red blood cells? What's different about these antibodies compared to what the Rh negative mother who's sensitized would make that would affect the baby? And this is actually a really cool question that's given me some thought, and the answer will come a little bit later on. But I thought I'd review this topic because I think it's going to lead to a lot of questions. So first of all, why do we care about Rh disease? So if we think back to the historical perspective, this actually used to be one of the biggest killers of newborn babies. Historically, it had killed or affected over 100,000 babies in the US per year. And undiagnosed, this leads to a 24% mortality in newborns, even today. And what happened is in the 1970s, anti-D immunoprophylaxis came out, and it was able to reduce neonatal deaths by this cause by over 100 times. And now we only see this disease occur in about 0.4 per thousand births. So just taking a step back to antigens and blood groups. So you, as you recall that there are, are different antigens and there's a couple major blood groups, A, B, and O. And through a combination, you can have the various antigens on your blood cells. But in addition just to the major blood groups, there actually are many different surface antigens present on red blood cells. Um, and the one we're most curious about is going to be the D antigen, because that's what's responsible for rhesus disease. But there also are all kinds of different antigens that can cause significant risk for baby. Uh, for example, KEL. So we always learn the acronym KEL kills. Because KEL is interesting because it's one of the diseases that's highly one of the antigens that's highly implicated in hemolytic disease of the newborn. But that's beyond the, this, this course today. So just talking about Rh sensitization, how it happens. So again, this requires an Rh negative mother. So again, there, there's two copies of each, um, of, of each D uh, allele. And then if you look at your Punnett square, the father can either be uh, homozygous for big D, big D, or heterozygous for big D, little d. So you can see that depending on whether the father is homozygous or heterozygous, this can lead to either 100% of the kids having Rh, disease, Rh positive antigen or 50%. So in this case, the fetus has to have some Rh positive in order to get sensitized. So what this means again is that the fetus will, the red blood cells in the fetus will express some of this Rh antigen. And this sensitization only occurs when there is fetal maternal hemorrhage. And what this does is once the fetal blood cells cross into maternal circulation, this triggers an immune response and development of anti-D antibodies. And if you do nothing, what happens is 12 to 16 percent of Rh negative women delivering an Rh positive baby will actually develop these antibodies. And as we talked about previous, this is actually tremendously harmful to our, our fetuses as well as our babies. So again, why should we care? Again, what happens is that if these antibodies are present, they bind to the fetal red blood cells and they start getting destroyed. And this leads to neonatal anemia. Then the body tries to compensate and the fetus will develop a tachycardia and then eventually develop heart failure. And then a condition called hydro hydrops fatalis. Uh, this basically is just fluid buildup in the fetus. There can be multiple different causes, uh, but this used to be actually the most common cause. So you see basically uh, fluid buildup ascites, uh, skin edema, polyhydramnios, placental edema, pericardial effusions and pleural effusions that are there. And this is a very high mortality, about 50% depending on the, uh, the cause of the, the high drops. And again, the treatments are sort of beyond the, the scope of this course, but we actually will even do in utero transfusions. Too bad Dr. Tracy Pressy isn't here, because she's actually one of the, the few doctors in BC that will actually do the in utero transfusions directly into the umbilical cord. Um, further on, babies can get exchange transfusions, and delivery, of course, is a way to sort of separate the baby from the ongoing uh, anti -D, uh, antibodies that are present from the mom. So, how do we screen for this? So first of all, we screen in every pregnancy. So we do a group and screen at the first prenatal visit. Uh, so the screen is a group will just tell you the major groups as well as whether or not the mom is Rx positive or Rx negative. But the antibody screen is where they start looking for those various subgroups. So we do it at the first prenatal visit. And then we, for Rx negative mothers, we repeat a group and screen at 28 weeks. The reason why we repeat it is that there is a very small proportion, about 0.18%, that will be sensitized in pregnancy by 28 weeks. Some Jurisdictions have chosen not to repeat this 28 uh, week screen, um, but currently in Canada we do recommend it. And I personally have seen someone get sensitized uh, before their 28 week Rogam shot.
So, and again, once sensitization occurs, there is no more benefit to anti-immunoglobulin. The mum is producing way more antibodies than what is given through Rogam. So what can cause sensitization? So again, remember, we have that hemochorial uh, placental division, and there's a clear divider between maternal and fetal blood. So something has to disrupt that barrier. So in early pregnancy, this can be abortion, whether it's spontaneous or therapeutic, ectopic pregnancies, molar pregnancies. In the antepartum and interpartum periods, it could be an abruption, so the placenta separating, trauma to the abdomen, delivery, and also iatrogenic causes like amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling, as well as procedures like external cephalic version where we try to turn a breech baby uh, to, to vertex presentation. And finally, sometimes it's just idiopathic. We just don't know. So how do we prevent Rx disease? And this is where the anti-D immunoglobulin comes into play. And this comes from various names. So in Canada, you'll typically see Winro because it's made in Winnipeg. And this is obtained from purified human plasma. So the, really, there's been no reported transmissions of infectious disease at all with this injection, despite the thousands of women who have gotten this shot. And the mechanism is that we've got, we provide anti-D immunoglobulin because what this is going to do is it's going to float around and bind any loose uh, fetal red blood cells with the Rh antigen loose in the maternal circulation. It'll grab them all so the maternal immune system cannot see it and will not develop antibodies against it. So when do we actually give it? So ideally we give this uh, within 72 hours of any event and there is some benefit up to 28 days. Um, we give it sort of after every single first trimester loss or any invasive uh, diagnostic procedure. But we also give 300 micrograms at 28 weeks and then 300 micrograms postpartum. Uh, I have written there 120 or 300 in the first semester. Uh, some jurisdictions will divide before 12 weeks. There's less fetal bloods. So therefore, we'll give a slightly lower dose. Practically in BC, we just give everyone 300 micrograms so we don't have to think about it. So... Sometimes 300 micrograms is not enough though. So 300 micrograms of anti-D immunoglobulin will cover about 30 milliliters of fetal whole blood, which is equivalent to about 50 milliliters of fetal red blood cells. You think about your hematocrit being about 40%. So for example, if you have a delivery and the baby bleeds 45 milliliters of red blood cells in maternal circulation, we actually want to give 900 micrograms of the anti-D to make sure we're covering enough immunoglobin to sop up all that uh, fetal red blood cell uh, Rh antigen that's there. So the way we actually test for it is actually something called the Kleihauer beck -Key test. It's a funny name, but I promise you'll be seeing more and more of this in your clinical practice. So what this relies on is the fact that fetal hemoglobin is actually much more stable than normal adult hemoglobin. So we actually do an acid elution test. We take a sample of mum's blood and we expose it to acid. The maternal cells are fragile and they will actually uh, break apart and they become white ghost cells. But the fetal hemoglobin is more stable and actually will remain red. So again, if you take a look on the right side, you can see this field of ghost cells, but within it, there's actually little red uh, fetal blood cells that are there. So what, uh, what a, a pathologist will actually do is they'll actually count all the fetal blood cells compared to the rest of the maternal blood cells and actually do a calculation to tell you how much fetal blood is actually there. So this is done routinely to every single mother who's delivered an Rh positive uh, baby and if the mother is Rh negative. So, you know, that's a lot of work. So the question is, does it work? And yes, it does. So when we think about antepartum sensitization, for example, this is an Rh negative mother, and of course we don't know whether the baby is Rh positive or negative, this actually, giving this immunoglobin actually drops the sensitization from 1.6 to 1.9% down to 0.2%. And if you think about postpartum after delivering an Rh positive baby, this reduces sensitization from 12, 12 to 16% down to 1.6 to 1.9%. So this does work and this actually saves lives. So going back to your, to your colleagues' questions, and this is a really cool question again. So this question again was, why does, why, if the antibodies that we provide from the anti-D immunoglobulin for immunoprophylaxis, they can cross over through the placenta, why don't they attack the newborn red blood cells? And if we think back to that calculation earlier, is the amount that we are given, 300 micrograms, only covers uh, 15 milliliters of fetal red blood cells. And again, not all of that 300 micrograms is actually going to get through. In fact, only a small proportion will actually get through the placenta to the baby. So very little, little of the fetal red blood cells are actually attacked by this anti-D uh, immunoglobulin. So as far as we know that this is actually safe. But you're absolutely correct, your colleague is correct that this does get through to the baby. And 
there actually are case reports of this. So I had a chance to look this up myself. And this is a publication from 2016 in a little bit of a sketchy journal uh, from data from India. And basically, they presented a case where uh, they had a baby that presented with hemolytic disease of the newborn. Uh, and this was thought to be secondary just to the antenatal uh, Rogam administration in an Rh negative mother. So your colleague's not wrong. But officially, this is incredibly rare. This is the only case report I could find in literature. And as far as we know, we should be telling our patients this is safe. So anyways, thanks for an interesting topic. I hope you're enjoying the rest of your lectures, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Take care. Bye.